So Lewis theory is a simplification. Um, writing electrons as dots is actually like a drastic oversimplification of what's going on. I mean, we talked earlier about the wave functions and all of that, and the dots make the dots look really simple in comparison to that. One of the things that happens um, is that the electrons that are shared, say between hydrogen and fluorine, are not shared equally. Fluorine is an electron hog. And when they share, it's like, you know, you, you share a cookie with your little brother and you cut the cookie in half, but it's not really in half, right? And if he's young enough, you can get away with giving him the little tiny piece and he thinks he's got some cookie and he's happy. It's not sharing equally, right? That happens with the electrons. And we can observe that this is so by putting molecules in an electric field. And what we observe is that hydrogen fluoride molecules will line up with an electric field. If the electrons were shared equally, we would not expect that to happen. Here's no electric field, and they're oriented all randomly. In an electric field, we, we see that they line up. And this is because of the electrons not being shared. So here we've got a picture down here. Here's fluorine, and here's hydrogen. And back to the neighborhood analogy. I think of um, electrons as being like little boys. I've told you that before. And, and the houses are like the nucleus. And so you think of, of these two little electrons, one from hydrogen house and one from fluorine house, and they're going to play together. Well, hydrogen house has a black and white TV, and they've got an old VCR and some Barney tapes. And if you're hungry, the mom will give you a glass of water. They don't even have an ice maker and, and maybe some saltine crackers. But at Florine's house, they have this huge full wall TV, and they've got every channel you can think of. They actually have a soda fountain in the kitchen. And the mom will order Pizza Hut delivered if you just even mention that you're hungry. Where are those kids going to spend more time? They're going to be at Florine's house, right? Most of the time, because it's more attractive. Fluorine is more attractive for electrons. So when hydrogen and fluorine share electrons, it's not equal. It's lopsided. So the electrons are spending more time around the fluorine than they are around the hydrogen. And that causes a lopsided charge. So one end is partially negative, and one end is partially positive. This is the Greek letter delta. It looks like a, a letter D with a, a posture problem. Um, and we use that to represent a partial charge. This is not an ionic compound. This is a partial charge. And what exactly that charge is, we don't really care that much. It's less than one. So there's a partial positive charge here and a partial negative charge here. And so when we put that in an electric field, the negative end is attracted to the positive electrode. The positive end is attracted to the negative electrode. And we call this a polar covalent bond. What are the ends of the Earth, the top and the bottom, called? The north and the south pole, right? And that's based on magnetic fields. There's a difference. That's why a compass works. The little needle always points towards the north pole. It's lining up with this electric field. So Poles, you sometimes talk about, well, they're polar opposites, right? They're exactly on the opposite side. So polar means there's different ends to this bond. One's more negative, one's more positive. Another way we represent this is with an arrow. The arrow is pointing towards the more negative one, and then we add a little plus over here. And I think of this as, as like being the helpful neighbor. Hydrogen mom comes out, or somebody comes looking. Maybe it's dad. It's dad. Dad comes home from work. And he's like, where are those boys? And the neighbor points. They're over there. That's where they are. So the arrow is pointing to the side where the electrons spend more time. Polar covalent bonds are sort of intermediate between an ionic bond, which involves a complete transfer of electrons. This would be like Florine's family adopting the sun from hydrogen. He doesn't belong at hydrogen anymore. They could take him out of the state or out of the country to be fine, 
He's theirs now. That's not what we're talking about with a polar covalent bond. These boys are going to go to Hydrogen's house occasionally because Hydrogen still loves his mom. I mean, the hydrogen electron still loves his mom. He's going to go over there and say hi, maybe get some clean underwear, right? But they're going to spend most of their time over at the flame. A purely covalent bond is shared between equals, and the electrons are going to be equally distributed. That would be the, the two houses having the same amount of funness, the same amount of attractiveness for little boys. Then their time is going to be split more equally. Well, we measure the attractiveness of the house for the little boys in terms of the attractiveness of an atom for an electron as electronegativity. So electronegativity, the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself in a chemical bond. This is going to be related to atomic size. So there's a definite trend in the periodic table, and this is probably one of the more important trends to understand. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Fluorine is, his house is just tricked out. It's the best place to be. We don't consider the noble gases in terms of electronegativity. We just ignore them completely because they are so unreactive. Some of them don't form compounds at all, and the others that do, you pretty much have to force them. So they, they just, they're just not even on the scale. So here is a um, sort of an elevation view of the periodic table in terms of electronegativity. And generally speaking, as we go towards fluorine, we're getting more electronegative. So if you're going across a period, in general, electronegativity increases. As you go up a group, electronegativity increases. So the way I remember this is fluorine is the best place, and if you're getting closer to fluorine, you're more electronegative than something that's farther away from fluorine. Sometimes you will need to actually look at these values. Um, I think there's some homework questions, and we see there's this kind of a bump here in the middle. Um, on an exam, I, if you needed the actual numbers, I would give them to you. There's no point in memorizing them. Um, but you might need to use some of them in the, in the homework. <coughs> Fluorine has an electronegativity of 4. They just decided that 4 was the maximum, and everything else is compared relative to, to fluorine. And so the lowest is over here. Um, these guys are 0.7. That's, that's not where you want to play if you're an electron. So I just explained what polar covalent bonds are. But is, is it just? Either you're polar covalent or you're not. There's, there's a, a continuum. So the degree of polarity is going to depend on the difference in electronegativity. How unequally those electrons are shared depends on how attractive, the difference in attractiveness between the two atoms. And so if we look at electronegativity difference, um, an electronegativity difference of zero is going to happen between two identical atoms, right? A hydrogen molecule is two hydrogen atoms with a covalent bond. That's going to have a difference of zero. You can sometimes have a difference of zero with other elements, but for the most part, if you have different elements, it's going to be a little bit different in electronegativity. So that's obviously a pure covalent bond. But just kind of arbitrarily, they've said if the difference is up to 0.4, we're going to call this a pure covalent bond. If the difference is between 0.4 and 2, that's a polar covalent bond. It's still shared electrons, but unequally shared. And then we say if the difference gets above 2, then we basically have an ionic bond. So those divisions, where these lines are drawn, are arbitrary. Any questions? So you could look at this table and say, OK, well, if, if we have a bond between arsenic and nitrogen, the difference in electronegativity between 3 and 2 is a difference of 1. 
And so then we could look at this chart and say, oh, well, one, that's a polar covalent bond. If you look at carbon and hydrogen, hydrogen is 2.1, carbon is 2.5. What's the difference? 0.4. So carbon-hydrogen bonds are right on this line here. A little polar, but really not enough to think about. Okay. Another way we can measure bond polarity is by looking at dipole moment. This always reminds me of people say, oh, I was having a senior moment. You know, I just forgot. Dipole moment. Um, dipole moment is going to occur whenever we have a separation of positive and negative charge. So we, if we have this partial positive, partial negative charge in a polar covalent bond, we have a dipole moment. Um, it has the symbol mu, and mu is equal to Q, the charge magnitude times the distance, R. So that distance is generally going to be the, the bond length. Um, a common unit for this is the Debye, which is 3.34 times 10 to the minus 29 Coulomb meters. Um, you might need that in a, a homework problem we're not going to do a ton with actually calculating these. If we look at these molecules, here's chlorine. Two identical atoms. The change, the difference in electronegativity is zero. The dipole moment is zero. There's no separation of charge. The dipole moment is zero. In um, chlorine monofluoride, the difference in electronegativity is one. If we look at the dipole moment and calculate that, it's 0.88. Uh, hydrogen fluoride has a higher dipole, a higher difference in electronegativity and a corresponding higher dipole moment. So the trend is the same, increasing change in electronegativity, increasing dipole moment, but this takes into account how long the bond is. And so it's more quantitative. But that's what a dipole moment is. Any questions? Another way to look at the degree of polarity is percent ionic character. It's the ratio of the bond's actual dipole moment to the dipole moment it would have if the electron was completely transferred. So we're comparing what it actually is to what it would be if it actually transferred the electron. It's important to understand that no bond is 100% ionic. We think about that. We think about them that way. Oh, well, it transferred the electron, it's done. There's actually no 100% ionic bond. If, if we have over 50% ionic character, then we consider the bond to be ionic. So here we're graphing percent ionic character versus electronegativity difference. And we see that there's clusters. What do you notice in common about the types of elements in this group versus this group? I think metals and non-metals. Anybody see it? What kind of elements are these? They're non-metals. Non-metals and non-metals. And what do we see up here? Metals with non-metals, right? The exception, of course, is hydrogen. Hydrogen fluoride. These are all considered ionic. They have more than 50% ionic character. If we look at electronegativity difference, they're up around 2. If we go back to this, that's where we arbitrarily drew a line and said, past this, we're going to consider it ionic. So these guys are considered ionic. Um, pretty much by either standard. Some of these are a little lower. What was the very simple way, when we were talking about nomenclature, that we identified ionic compounds? Ionic compounds form between what kinds of elements? Metals and nonmetals. And a molecular compound was between what? Two nonmetals. 
So this is a more fancy way of looking at it, but it gives the same result, doesn't it? Percent ionic character, difference in electronegativity are going to give pretty much the same result. Nonmetals uh, are going to be covalent, and nonmetals with metals are going to be ionic. Mm -hmm. No, hydrogen fluoride does not. And so even though he's up here in this cluster, by the 50% ionic rule, he'd still be considered a covalent compound. Now, he's a very polar covalent compound. Hydrogen and fluorine, that's the largest electronegativity difference that you can get between two nonmetals. He's almost, but not quite. Any questions? So we need to be able to classify bonds as pure covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. And we should be able to do this just with a periodic table. It's great to have tables of electronegativities and all kinds of other stuff. But bottom line is we can do this just with a periodic table. So iodine and iodine, bond between those two elements. What's that going to be? Pure covalent. I'm going to call that PC. No, that's not going to work because the other one's going to be, I'm just going to call that covalent. Nonpolar. How about cesium and bromine? Ionic. How do we know that? Why are we going to say that? Cesium is a metal. We look at the periodic table. Cesium and bromine are on opposite sides. But really, the bottom line is metal, nonmetal, it's going to be ionic. How about phosphorus and oxygen? Got two nonmetals. So it's got to be some kind of covalent, right? What do you think? Polar or nonpolar? Like, well, I'd like to see that table of electronegativities again. So here's a rule of thumb works most of the time. I think things that work most of the time are pretty good. Most of the time, if these two elements are different, most of the time it's going to be polar. There are some bonds between different nonmetals that are considered purely covalent, but they are the exception. Most of the time, they're going to be polar. So we're going to call that one polar. Should we go look at the chart and see if we're right? Let's go back here. Um, oxygen, 3.3. Phosphorus, 2.1. I'm sorry, 3.5 and 2.1. So that's a difference of 1.4, right? So our guess was correct. That one's, that one's polar. Because if we look at this, 1.4 is in here somewhere. It's definitely a polar bond.